So the context um, for me, uh, this is Port Regis School, which is the host school for our summer courses. Um, this is where I work in the summer, um, where I've worked in the summer for the last 15 or so years. Um, it's a lovely school. It's out in the countryside in Dorset. It has big, big grounds um, with lots of um, playing fields and woodland. Um, it's got ponds. It's got a river running through the ground. So it's a, it's a really good environment for the kind of thing that we're going to be talking about today. But I'm conscious that um, many people uh, work in an urban context. Um, we, we're working here with children, but also I'm, I'm sure that many of the things that I'm gonna be talking about today will be um, relevant to adults as well. So as we're going through, um, I'm making an effort to um, remember and refer to urban situations as well as rural ones. So why uh, ELT outdoors? Um, well, first of all, for variety. Um, in our case, um, children, teenagers generally sit indoors to have their lessons. And if they're coming to us in the UK and we've got, you know, these this lovely campus, then we may as well use it. So, so it's for the sake of teaching variety, and that would apply in whatever context you're in. If you're in a town or a city um, and you have parks uh, around, then um, I, I would argue that you should be thinking about making use of those natural environments um, for your teaching, just as we make use of ours. Um, why outdoors? Well, um, because we can provide a multi-sensory experience. So the, the old saying is, you know, um, uh, children um, learn quite a lot when they uh, see and hear or when they listen and speak. Um, but it's that much more memorable when um, taste, perhaps, um, certainly sensations of touch and, and um, uh, the you know, the breath of the air or the touch of a piece of bark or whatever. Um, things are simply more memorable, the more senses that can be involved. Um, we'd like to try to create a connection to nature um, for the people we work with. Um, it's very important and that there are two kinds of connections. One is a sort of an intellectual understanding of what's going on with the environment. And that's really important, perhaps more so with um, the upper age groups. Um, but at, at, the, at the lower end with children, um, if they're not able to, perhaps it's, it's not a good idea for them to understand the full complexity of what's happening to, um, to, the, to the planet at the moment from an environmental point of view. Um, but by connecting them to nature and giving them an appreciation of nature, we're hopefully setting them up to have um, a concern for um, the outdoors and for the outdoor environment as they get older. And you can't like something and then not be concerned when you see it under threat. Another reason for doing ALT outdoors is because it caters for different learning styles. So um, I, have a, I have three sons, actually, but the middle son has never really um, been one to kind of sit down uh, behind a desk and study all day. It's fine for some it's not fine for others. So the, the more sort of active, outgoing perhaps, kinesthetic types of learners respond very well to getting up out of their seats and even better getting out of the classroom perhaps where they can run around. And uh, to that, that extent, getting out of the classroom is also active and healthy. And then finally, um, it's essential for the future. Um, this is connected to the idea of connecting children with nature, but, you know, we're not in a good place environmentally, as I'm sure you all know, um, and uh, we need to use the influence that we have um, in our profession to, to try to raise awareness, um, bring people closer to the things that matter, and try to create a better future. After all, if we're working with children, then we are by definition talking about the future. So here's our opportunity to try to make it slightly better. Uh, some considerations, um, pedagogical balance. Uh, by this, I mean that 
uh, each of us, if we're thinking about out of class activities, need to be thinking about balancing activity with language learning. So for example, and this will vary according to the context and how much time you have. So if you're only working with a class, maybe for one hour per week, you're not going to want to go out of the classroom and spend 45 minutes of that time drawing a tree because you know parents will probably rightly say well you know this isn't what we're paying for we're paying for them to learn english on the other hand if you have children with you for a week or four weeks or however long it is they might think yeah yeah that fine that time is justified um that that activity is worthwhile in itself in creating a, a very strong connection actually between somebody and what they're drawing um, and we can then build on that um, linguistically for the purposes of language learning. Risk assessment, of course, uh, if you are going outside the classroom, then you need to, uh, particularly if you're working with um, youngsters, you, you need to be sure that um, the environment you're taking them to is, is safe. So that really involves checking out where you're going first and um, making notes of possible risks um, and talking to your colleagues about those risks and ways of reducing them. Uh, and then finally, of course, there's permission and politics. Um, permissions from parents, if you're taking them out of the classroom, doing anything different, of course, you need permission for that. You need permission from your school if you're going to be taking them out of the classroom. So you need to be sure about you know, what you're doing and why. And I'm just mentioning politics because I'm aware that um, in some contexts, parents may, uh, not just parents actually, but uh, some uh, adults even may, may say, well, you know, what are we doing? It's not our job um, to be talking about the environment, to be talking about green issues. Um, and that's something you need to be aware of and to be ready to answer. Okay, so first activity, um, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to show you an activity which I call leaving the classroom without leaving the classroom. Um, and uh, it involves playing you uh, an audio clip, which is always slightly risky in PowerPoint because embedding clips into PowerPoint is never the easiest thing, but let's give it a go. Um, the language is quite difficult. Um, and the speaker, I believe, is from Northern Ireland. Um, so you may, you may struggle to understand every word the speaker says. Um, so I've put a bit of script on the screen here, and you might need to move things around a bit so that you can actually see that script, but it should help you to understand um, the, what you're hearing. So I'm just gonna start this and see if I can move it forward to um, 3.25. And just listen for a couple of minutes, just relax and just listen to this. Fingers crossed. That you may have been holding on to. Thanks. Imagine that you're walking barefoot in a beautiful garden. The sun is shining overhead and the warm grass under your bare feet gently massages your feet as you walk along the well manicured lawns. This is you feel the warmth of the sun shining down on you, bringing glorious rays of healing energy onto and into your body. Bird song can be heard in the trees and shrubs all around the garden. The flowers which contain every colour of the rainbow play host to butterfly and bumblebee. Each breath you take in fills your lungs with the perfume created by the hand of Mother Nature. As the scents of the flowers fill your lungs, it awakens and stimulates your senses. With each breath you take, you are releasing all that stress and tension. You feel your body relaxing more and more with each breath. And as you become more at one with the nature that surrounds you in this magical garden, the more relaxed you are becoming. As you walk along the grass, in the distance you can see a solitary oak tree standing as tall as the white fluffy clouds overhead. 
Okay. So uh, I don't know about you, but just listening to that makes me feel quite relaxed, really, and um, and and builds a, a picture, a multi-sensory picture, in fact, um, even here at the computer. So I mean, you can, to a certain extent, take people out of the classroom while they're still in the classroom through this kind of activity. If you just get onto YouTube and Google um, nature meditations, you'll find this and, and others like it. Now, clearly, the language here is, is quite difficult, um, so you might want to be using it with, with higher level learners. Um, but as teachers, you can, you can think about ways of using a text like this. Um, my point, really, is that um, you can then extend this to the outdoors. So if, you, if your students have enjoyed this, then whatever their level, you can take them outside somewhere into a park or into the school grounds or whatever, and just ask them to think about a similar meditative narrative. I mean, the language is, to, it, to, in one sense, it's quite simple. It's all present tense. It's all um, present continuous or, or simple present. Um, I think it's called the narrative present, um, and, and it's perfect for this kind of stream of consciousness language. Um, so it's not difficult for students to say something like, you know, walk along the path, look to the sides, you can see the flowers, you can see the bees in the flowers, continue in the distance, you can see a tree. Uh, walk to the tree, sit down under the tree, look up into the branches, lie down, have a look at the clouds above the sky, etc. So that's all fairly simple language, um, which is within the competence of your students. And if they go out maybe in pairs and create a little meditation, they can then share it with others um, in the classroom or in other classes. There's one simple activity for you. Now, um, in terms of relaxation, we uh, or we like always when we start an outdoor activity with uh, the youngsters who we work with, we like to start off with um, some relaxation, not necessarily sitting on a log, it can be lying on the ground. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated, it can be as simple as lie down on the ground, feel the weight of your limbs, your arms and your legs on the ground. Um, there's a yoga technique called scanning, where it says, imagine that you're scanning from the top of your head down through your body. And as you scan down, you relax each part of your body. And you can then focus for a couple of minutes on breathing, just, you know, focus on your breathing, um, relax, just feel the breath coming in and out of your body quite effortlessly. Um, and then we like to extend it a little bit to say, um, and, and now uh, extend your awareness to everything around you. So what can you hear? What can you feel? So can you feel the breath of the wind? Can you hear the birds in the trees? Can you hear the leaves rustling? Um, and, and when we go out on uh, these um, out of class activities, we like if possible to start with a relaxation exercise. It gets everybody in the right place. And it makes teaching much simpler as well, because people tend not to be quite so excited and pent up when they start the activity. OK, so what kind of things can we um, teach in the outdoors? Well, here is just a whole load of ideas. Um, what do you call? How do you spell? You can go on a walk and students can ask questions. What do you call that? How do you spell that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Simply make notes. It's a vocabulary building exercise. Should or shouldn't. Um, you can learn and act out the country code, uh, the countryside code. So the countryside code in England is things like don't drop litter or you shouldn't drop litter. Um, close gates after you've been through them. Don't leave gates open. You should not leave the gate open. Um, don't allow your dog to chase the sheep or you shouldn't allow your dog to chase the sheep. So that things like that. Um, where do you find the countryside code? Well, you Google it, of course. Um, and, and for all of these things, if you're in any doubt, or oh, where do I find that information? Google is, has the answer nearly always. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with something like the countryside code. I mean, we've, we've got videos of children pretending to be dogs and sheep chasing each other around and somebody saying, you shouldn't allow your dog to chase the sheep around the field. So it can be a lot of fun as well. Um, there is, there are some any prepositions, uh, draw and describe a scene, uh, there are some birds in the trees, I'll come back to that later, um, that can be quite, um, um, uh, quite, quite a lengthy activity around describe and draw. And then describing location. Um, 
if you, you can make a plan of the school grounds and write about it. So making a plan is fun, it's quite challenging. Um, and uh, writing about it even more so, it's quite academic. Uh, the school is approached by a long avenue lined with trees, that kind of language. Let's continue. Okay, comparison and contrast. Um, measure trees. This one's bigger than that one. This one, the circumference of this tree is bigger than that one. Um, you can race sticks in a river. You know, um, you can compare and contrast leaves, insects, flowers, etc. Taller, shorter, shortest, etc. Faster, slower, more colourful, most colourful, least colourful, etc. So comparison and contrast based on things that you can find in the natural environment. Describing colours and textures. Um, all kinds of scavenger hunts. Um, well, actually, all kinds of hunts. Um, so a scavenger hunt is where um, you can find um, or think of, for example, 20 objects that the children, are, 20 natural objects that the children are likely to find in the locality. So it could be, um, oh, I don't know, a, a, a purple flower or, or uh, something furry or um, something with a hard texture. Um, and ask them to go out and note where they found these things. Um, there's a very simple way to do a scavenger hunt. Um, uh, sorry, um, and having found these objects, you can then play something like Kim's Nature Game. I don't know if you know Kim's Game. It's a memory game, really. Um, and if you're, for example, if you take your students out into nature for a walk, you could ask all of them to go away and find something natural, which is unique. So say you've got 10 kids with you. So, okay, I want all of you to go away, find something natural, a, a stone, a flower, a, you know, whatever it is, uh, bring it back to a central point. If somebody else has found it, you have to take it away, you have to find something else until you've got 10 unique objects. You then learn the names of the objects, talk about them a little bit, and then cover them up. And this is the basis of Kim's Nature Game where the kids then try to remember what was under um, the towel or the blanket or whatever you've got to cover the objects. And kids just enjoy playing it. Another way to do it is to remove one of the objects from underneath, reveal it, and the kids have to try and tell you which object is missing. Okay. Um, directions. Uh, very obviously the outdoors lends itself to this. Um, create a nature trail. Um, plan and go on a country walk. So you plan it in classroom, you get maps out or you go on Google Maps, you learn all about your town or the campus or wherever you're situated and say, right, we, we're going we're gonna to plan this walk and then we're going to go on this walk. And you can, you can make it ecological by um, connecting parks, for example, um, and, and looking for um, natural environment in your locality. Um, and, you know, it's quite complex language as well. So, you know, go through the woods and turn left down the grass track, etc. Um, if this is uh, done properly by the students, it's, it's quite a challenging and, and very useful activity. Uh, past narrative. So having been on your walk, you then back in the classroom, put it into the past. Uh, first, we walked down the grass track, then we turned left and you can use the map. Um, as a reminder as to where you've been and where your walk went. Uh, so you simply turn it into a past narrative. Um, instructions. Uh, there are various, let me just remove this for a second. Yeah. Um, there are various kind of activities you can do making things. Um, for example, you can make a sundial. Um, so you first um, take a piece of card and cut a hole in the center and then, and so on and so on. And by the way, while I'm talking, for example, I mentioned creating a sundial. I don't have time to, um, you know, to go into detail as to how we do everything. But if there are things that you're thinking, oh gosh, yes, you know, I'd, I'd really like to do that, then please make a note of it. I'll give you my email address at the end and you're welcome to write to me and I'll send you everything that we've got um, to help you to do that activity. Okay, and uh, classification. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the big things about um, outdoor exploration, nature studies, if you like. Um, 
it, it involves this area called classification, which, which often doesn't get covered by standards for the VFL text. So, for example, collecting, sorting, and identifying leaves or flowers or insects, etc. Um, typical language would be, you know, evergreen trees can be divided into four basic types, dot, dot, dot. And finally, um, prediction. Um, you could contemplate the effects of time upon a scene. Um, you know, so you're looking at a scene, you've described what you can see, and you can say, well, imagine this scene in a better future. I don't know why it says 2005. 2035 would be better. Um, so you're imagining um, the scene in a better future. Um, so we say by 2035, the road will have disappeared, the trees will have been replanted, um, the, the skies will be clearer, the air will be clean, etc. So um, on that subject of imagining a better future, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing um, during the past two summers whilst our school has been closed because of COVID. So um, I, in my local community, I set up a Facebook site called Winchcombe Greentown. And the idea, I, I live in a place called Winchcombe. It's a town of about 10,000, maybe a few more thousand people. And um, I set up a Facebook site trying to explore what it would take to make Winchcombe a more sustainable town. And so the questions were, well, you know, what kind of things can we do to reduce the carbon footprint from my town and to increase biodiversity? And um, we held a public meeting. Well, we've held two public meetings now. This was the first one that you can see on the photograph here. And, um, Lots more people came along than we expected and talked about the issues. And by the end of it, we had six action groups. We had a transport group who were interested in things like um, encouraging the take up of electric vehicles, um, providing public uh, electric vehicle charging points, uh, trying to reduce the speed limits in the town, um, trying to find ways for heavy goods vehicles to bypass the town, um, trying to improve provision for pedestrians and cyclists. So that's a transport group. And we have a group called Nature First, which is very, very active. And their main aim was to plant more trees. Um, but there's also a rewilding group that um, tries to um, plant lots of wildflowers in the locality. Um, we have another group that's interested in um, protection and support for hedgehogs, which may seem a small animal, but it's kind of indicative of a general decline of wildlife. So if you can do something for one creature, you're actually improving things for all. So creating wildlife corridors through the town, for example. And we have a swift support group, um, uh, a group to, um, that puts up new nesting boxes to encourage the return of the birds called swifts. We have a homes and energy group that are interested in um, insulating people's homes, using less energy um, and, and ways, for example, of um, making that happen by, um, by scaling things up. So if one person wants a solar panel on their roof, it's going to cost X. But if 50 people want solar panels on their roof, then obviously the price comes right down. So that's what they're interested in. Um, Bear with me, I do have a reason for telling you all of this. Um, a waste not group, and, and they are concerned with recycling, um, repairing things instead of throwing them away, um, refusing things in the first place, so refusing plastic in shops, for example. Um, so that's they're, they're on the, um, the, the sort of the reduction side of consumer activity. And we have a discussion group which is you can imagine what that is around environmental issues and then finally we have a green money matters group and that's all about finance and ways of using the pound in your pocket um, to to bring about positive change so why am i telling you all about this well it occurred to me that it could make a really good activity for your students um, whether they are um, teenagers or adults and you could start by simply asking the same question we did, what makes a green town? Um, and then try to imagine a better future. It's really important. And, and a lot, uh, 
we've discovered that quite a lot of people find it quite hard to envision a better future because it really involves just letting go of all the uh, all the um, tendencies to say oh, we can't do this because we can't do this just let your imagination go um, and imagine a better future and there's an excellent book called from what is to what if by the um, somebody who who founded the transition towns movement which is all about imagining a better future i'd recommend it um, and then finally getting out of the classroom now visit people and places um, go to your local recycling facility talk to them what are the issues um, what are the challenges how are they trying to overcome them go to your local parks and talk to the park keepers the wardens about what they're trying to do um, again the challenges how it could be made better find environmental groups in your locality talk to them see what they're doing um, talk to town planners you know what are they doing to improve um, the uh, the air of your town for example what are they doing to try to reduce um, congestion or, or traffic on the streets and so on. Talk to transport providers, you know, public transport providers. What are the issues for them? How can, how can uh, more people be encouraged to take public transport? So there you go. Um, I hope that might actually provide something useful for you and might kickstart some of your students into thinking along, you know, the, the um, sustainability issues for the place where you live. But mainly I wanted to talk um, today about natural resources and, and how we can use those. So the question for you is, and, and I don't want you to answer this now, it's just for you to think, what are the natural resources in your school's neighbourhood and how can you use these to practice and develop your students' English? And I'm going to answer that question by showing you some of the things that we do at ECS. So first of all, I would say just get out. Um, if you're in the classroom and it's a beautiful day and you've got an activity which can as easily be done outside as inside, go outside. You'll discover that the very fact of getting out of the classroom um, relaxes your students um, and tends to um, put them in a, a more um, receptive frame of mind for whatever activity you're doing with them. So if you've got the choice, whatever you're doing, if you can do it outside, do it outside. Um, Here's a group of primary kids, um, the teacher you can see there on the right. He was very keen on encouraging young children to read um, because he said they spend too much time on, you know, mobile devices, and I'm sure that's true. So he would just make sure that for half an hour each week, he just took them to a pleasant place and they'd each cho choose a book and they'd just relax and read. And I think that's an incredibly valuable thing for them to do. Uh, we had some kids making bird feeders. You say, how do I make a bird feeder? Google it. This one is made with half a grapefruit and some um, crayons stuck through it and some string and then bird feed put in the top of it. Um, so Google it or get your kids to Google it. Make it, put it outside, see what happens. Student-led walks. I talked about countryside walks earlier on. Um, yeah, just get a map. Um, decide on an area where, you know, which is safe for them to, to walk in, not on their own, but make sure that they lead it. Uh, they really enjoy doing that. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a campus like ours, then do an eco tour. If you don't have a campus like ours, then do an eco tour of your town. Um, get a map out, have a look at all your local parks, join them up and do a tour of the different locations. In our case, um, the kids go out and they look at the new solar panels on the roofs of the buildings and explain why they're there and what they're doing and what they're saving. Um, we look at um, uh, the water borehole, which, they've, uh, which they're now using to provide uh, water rather than taking it from the mains. Um, we, uh, we look at the herb gardens, we look at the fruit trees that have been planted around the place, um, we go into the woods and we look at the beehives and we look at the bird boxes that have been put up and, and, and basically just have a nice time walking around the grounds. Um, and if you can find somebody from your host school, if you're, if you're in a host school, who knows about what's happening, they will be only too pleased to help you. 
Uh, lots of activities can be done about trees and leaves. Um, I've got four, five, six lessons on using um, trees and leaves for different out of class activities. Um, again, not time to go into the detail now, but if you're interested, email me at the end and uh, I'll send you what we've got. I will just mention one thing. Um, no, I won't. I, that would mean stopping sharing, which is risky. So we'll just push on. Um, mini beasts and pond dipping. If you've got ponds around you, um, then uh, kids of all ages, and they, these are, you know, what are they, 12, 13 year olds, really enjoy the activity more than, more than you might think for the age group. Um, and the, the only consideration for this kind of thing is the kit. Um, and if you get onto, well, I shouldn't really say Amazon, but if you get onto your favorite, um, you know, internet um, supplier, um, you'll find pond dipping kits at a very reasonable price and containing everything that you need to do this. So some other ideas, uh, fitness trail. Um, we, in this activity, we, we start in the classroom and we, we talk to the kids about, you know, what kinds of fitness are there? So we talk about strength, suppleness and stamina. And um, we look at different sports and we say, well, which sports develop strength? Which sports develop suppleness? That's flexibility, if you like. Which sports um, develop stamina? Um, and so having sort of looked at some of the language like that, we then say, OK, we're going to create a fitness trail out in the school grounds. So kids go away in groups and they do some research and they come up with um, exercises to be done at various stations around, uh, around the campus, um, uh, developing either strength, suppleness or fitness. So they've got to get the language right. Um, and then at each station, they post instructions as to what happens what people have to do and they then invite others to come around the trail and maybe accompany them to make sure that their instructions are good um, and it's just a simple way of using lots of language um, getting out of doors and really communicating um, a silent walk uh, you, it, that may sound a bit odd um, you know if it's silent then what language are you developing but we, we've used this many times and it works particularly well with younger children and what we do is we go out for a walk with them and uh, after a while we say okay we're just going to walk silently for a while and if you've got a group of 15 kids um, there'd be quite a bit of sort of giggling and messing about at first so you can have some kind of um you know if you say well you know if if, if i hear anybody talk then you have to do 10 press-ups or whatever and they love it so they'll talk or whatever just to do the press-ups um but uh, after a while they will settle down and you just walk silently and the instruction is simply listen to everything that um, you hear and feel everything you feel and at the end of about two minutes of silently walking, it is astonishing how much uh, the children come out with in terms of what they heard, what they felt, what they saw. So a really, really beneficial exercise that. Um, a bear hunt, you probably, uh, especially if you work with primary children, know, you know, we're going on a bear hunt, we're gonna catch a big one, what a beautiful day, we're not scared. Uh-oh, a wood, deep, dark wood that one. Um, so bear hunts work fantastically if you've got the right environment to practice them in. Um, and um, we like to finish ours with um, finding a bear. So there's, a, there's an ice house on the campus, which is quite dark and cave-like. And uh, in the past, we've put teachers, well, a teacher in there dressed up as a bear, not too scary. Or sometimes um, we've just put a little teddy bear under a bush and memorably on one occasion, the bear was brought back very proudly by the children um, on the back of our dog. <laughs> so they, they absolutely loved it. And they went around chanting, we're going on a bear hunt as they went through all the actions. So, you know, linguistically very valuable as well. I've talked about um, scavenger hunts, but other kinds of hunts, colour bingo. So you just provide a, um, a, a sheet with a palette of different colours. You say, go out and find something of each colour and mark on it where you found it. Uh, similarly with alphabet, um, find something outdoors beginning with A, find something beginning with B or whatever it is. 
Kim's game we talked about, uh, that's a memory game. Farm visit, if you're lucky enough, you can take, um, take people out to a farm. Farms we found uh, are very um, welcoming um, to small groups on condition that they feel that you've really um, prepared and researched in advance. And this can be a fantastic thing for the children because they're being taken seriously and they get to ask adults questions, um, have to listen to the answer. Um, but it's also just a, a, an intrinsically interesting environment for them and can lead to lots of follow-on work. Fauna and flora, um, obviously animals uh, in your locality, if you're lucky enough to, to have animals in your locality. Um, and flora, flowers, of course, um, you know, look at the different types of flowers, uh, use a field guide or take photos and then come back and Google the different flowers to see to see what there is growing in your locality at that time of year. Whether that's, you know, uh, rural or urban, there are always going to be flowers around uh, at the right time of year. Shadow clocks, I think I might have mentioned earlier on, it's making a, um, uh, a sundial effectively. Again, contact me if you'd like to know more about that. Photography, I'm going to come on to in a minute. Um, air pollution test is another one that we do. Um, uh, we put out um, pieces of card with uh, Vaseline on them, leave them out in various locations, come back a few days later to find out which are dirty and which are not, and then speculate as to why that might be. So it's a semi-scientific. So um, photography. Um, photography in both urban and rural settings, um, fantastic ways to, um, is a fantastic way to get people out of the classroom and, uh, <laughs> no pun intended, well pun intended, focusing on their environment. Um, and photography is also um, what I would call an opportunity for deep learning. What I mean by deep learning is all of this. Um, learning which is engaging. Um, in other words, the, the, the learners really feel part of the activity. Um, real world, so they're, they're learning a real skill. If they're, take, if they're learning to take better photos, for example, um, then they're not only giving themselves lifelong pleasure, and that they'll be able to take better photos in the future, um, but it may be a skill that's useful for them in their work in the future. Um, they can become more creative, more uh, perceptive. Um, deep learning is activities which are meaningful, where, you know, if you talk to people afterwards, you say, well, you know, what did that activity mean to you? How did it feel? And, and if, if an activity really sort of gets into people, so that they either thoroughly enjoy it or they feel thoroughly enthused by it, then it, it's meaningful to them and therefore memorable. It lasts for a long time. Um, deep learning is individual in that it's, it's an individual response to what they're doing and it's internalized. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. And it, it's, it's lasting. So deep learning is a kind of learning that, you know, two, three years later, if, if you ask somebody, you say, oh, God, I remember doing that. And, and it was just brilliant or, or whatever <laughs> their response to it is. Um, examples of deep learning, well, it could be conflict resolution. Um, you know, so this is, this is not directly um, related to language learning, but if you've got a couple of kids, for example, um, who are in conflict, if that is resolved skillfully, then there's an opportunity for deep learning by the individuals involved in that. They learn more about themselves and their reactions and how to avoid things. Um, Daffodils, uh, the famous poem by William Wordsworth. Um, I thought about including that in this presentation, but there just isn't time for it. Um, but I will come back to it. Uh, and poetry can be a really good example of deep learning in that it can be internalized, literally memorable if you remember the poem, it can keep coming back to you for years after. So it's really lasting. And if it's a good poem and the learner really engages with it, then it's meaningful. And what I'm really trying to say is that out of class learning has this potential um, for deep learning as well. So photography as an example of that. Um, how are we doing for time? Let me just make sure I'm not overrunning. Okay, fine. Um, so 
photography as an example of uh, a, what I think is a deep learning out of class activity. Um, first of all, uh, there's an element of choice in photography, and, uh, and that's important to any kind of project um, and important to the learners as well. If they're choosing an aspect of the project, then they're more likely to be interested in it and to relate to it. So um, they might choose to focus on landscape photo photography, that is um, photographing landscapes, not just um, you know, what we call the shape landscape. Or they might, they might choose to um, focus on portrait photography, taking photos of people, or action photography, or sport photography, or whatever it is. Uh, and like all good projects, um, it can involve a bit of research. So um, if uh, somebody has chosen to, um, to look at uh, portrait photography, they would then go away onto Google, um, who are the great portrait photographers? What made their portraits great? And they can then produce a mini presentation uh, based on their research. They can then go out and do field work. And this is the out of class element. Um, Individuality is important. If you're doing photography, it's one person behind the camera. So, so their decision as to what to photograph. Um, but connection is also really important because if you're out with a group, then there are the other people around you. And with photography, it inevitably means that um, people are turning the cameras on each other as well. Um, so there is that kind of social connection, which we've noticed again and again with um, photography activities. Um, and also connection to what you're photographing. It's impossible to photograph a flower, for example, even if it's just a very basic photograph. It's meaningful to the person photographing it, otherwise they wouldn't be photographing it. So what is that meaning? What is that connection? It's there straight away. And then having done the field work, um, you can then come back to a final presentation. In our case, um, our kids who join our photography workshops um, put all of their photos together and present them in an end of course review. And they each talk about their own photo, um, why they took it, where they took it, why they chose that subject, why they photographed it in that way, how they've edited it um, and what it means to them. So there's an opportunity for creativity and, and to a certain extent for recognition as well, which is, which is always valuable. So if you're going to do a photography workshop, you could think about, first of all, what makes a good photo? Always a good idea to start off with avoiding common mistakes. You know, make sure your thumb isn't in front of the lens when you take your photo. Make sure your hands aren't shaking, things like that. Again, if you Google avoiding common mistakes in photography, you'll find loads. And if you only do that, you'll have done all of your learners a big favor because they'll improve their, um, most of them will improve their photographs by 100% just by avoiding common mistakes. And then you could um, ask your students, do they want to focus on landscape, portrait, or action photography, sport photography, or whatever. So we take our students to a place called Wynn Green. This is Wynn Green. Um, and it's, it's really interesting for me because I drive the minibus and I must have taken, I don't know, maybe 20 different groups of children and teenagers up to this place uh, over the years. Um, and and the reason that's interesting for me is because I can see the effect that the landscape has on different groups. And to a certain extent, the effect is always the same. Um, this, this is Wynn Green, as you see, fan, fantastic views over um, the Dorset countryside. And as I mentioned before, the first thing to do is to get people to relax. Now, this this. This boy here was kind, kind of joking. He wasn't actually in a relaxing thing at the time. But just for the sake of illustration, um, don't forget when you start an activity, take that opportunity just to relax into the environment before you do anything else. Um, remind people why they're there. Here our teacher James uh, was uh, talking about what makes a good photograph. And there's, uh, he's holding up a photograph of some cows there. and. Um, well, you'll see why in a minute. Um, what I have noticed on these trips is that the kids just relax and become more sociable. Um, it's a lot of fun. And 
they just seem to get on better when they're in the outdoors in these open spaces, um, certainly compared to in the classroom. Um, and new, new relationships are, are formed or, or sort of deepened. Um, and I think that sense of sort of sociably relaxed environment really helps with the learning at the same time. Okay, I did promise you some more cows. Uh, here they are. Um, why cows? Well, because field work is experiential. Um, children, in this case, get to meet people or things, cows, um, that uh, they might not normally meet. Um, I mean, I take cows for granted, but actually you get right up close to a cow and it's, it's quite an experience, you know, with their noisy breathing and their slavering and the licking of lips and so on. And um, it, that, it's, it's a powerful thing um, for children to get close to, not exactly wildlife, but animals like this. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's experiential to the extent that the individual is meeting um, the environment. The fact that he's chosen, this boy has chosen to take a photograph of this flower, which in another situation he would have walked straight past or, or over, um, means that there's a connection and a care immediately already. Uh, and, and the other thing I've noticed about photography field work is the amazing creativity of the, um, the youngsters who take part in it. Um, you know, here's, here's a photograph of the, the bottom of a boy's trainer, which would not normally be taken, but he climbed up into the tree. And they all do climb up into the trees, by the way, on this trip. Every single one of them, teenagers and children as well, one of the first things they do is they get up into the trees. And um, so there's an opportunity there to take a photograph uh, from a different angle. Makes a really good photo. It's highly creative. And um, this is one of my favorite um, photos. Um, and I've got this on the wall in my office actually, because it's, it's, uh, it was actually set up um, by the photographer. So he said, oh, I want you to walk towards the trees, you know, with your arms around each other. And, um, and then edited afterwards to give it a bit of masking and to turn it black and white and so on. But the reason I love it is because it just kind of reminds me of these sort of the transience of these children sort of passing through this place, um, the permanence of the place, but also, I hope, the permanence of the impact of the place in the people who visited it. Right, I've talked a, a lot about um, photographing out in, um, out in the countryside, and I wanted to just refer you to some, um, uh, some work which focuses specifically on the urban environment. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second and start a new sharing. Yeah, here we are, good. Um, I hope you can see that um, this, very nice activity is produced by uh, an American lady and I just wanted to run you quickly through it. So there's a lot of preparation work in the classroom, um, including stories, um, focus on vocabulary, um, vocabulary matching, so learning things like soil, climate, concrete, these are all, you know, urban environments, uh, sorry, um, nature that can be found in urban environments, um, what ecosystems are around you, and this is quite a nice idea for any environmental situation, and then it goes lesson two into a wild neighborhood photo hunt. And um, people are gonna go out into their neighborhood and they're gonna find examples of nature in the urban environment. They're gonna photograph it, they're gonna label it, and they're gonna talk about it. Um, and there's a, a lesson four with a uh, wild neighborhood awareness poster and so on. So a really nice activity there. Okay, uh, if any of you um, 
are into screenshotting, <laughs> there's the link to the material I've just shown you on the urban environment. Um, you can also find it on our Green Action ELT website at that location. Okay, and there is just time to tell you about one last activity that we do. Um, we take our kids out for adventure camps. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we went out for a week, actually, well, five, six days of adventure camping. Um, this year, we're just doing a weekend adventure camp. Um, but we, on this particular camp, decided that we wanted to continue language learning. So it wasn't just going to be fun, adventurous activities, but we were going to try and use the environment um, to continue developing English. So we, we brought along this outdoor classroom and uh, a very simple uh, whiteboard there. Um, and uh, we uh, did various activities, including the one I'm going to show you, which is a describe and draw activity. So here's a, um, a picture that we showed the kids. It's called Wavenhoe Park. And we just showed it for a few minutes, or for a few seconds, actually. And then we covered it up and we asked them, OK, what can you remember? And they might have said a lake, the sky, a pond, whatever. Uh, just really trying to encourage observation. So then we'd go back to it and say, OK, have another look. All right, did you see anything else? And do it in that way. And then finally, we just revealed the picture from the top to the bottom and described what we could see there. And as we were doing that, whoops, as we were doing that, we boarded the vocabulary. So we, we would say things like, right, in the foreground, we can see a fence um, running from the bottom left side of the picture to the, uh, to the bottom middle of the picture. In the middle of the picture, there's a lake. In the distance, we can see a mansion or a castle behind the trees. And in the far distance, we can see the sky and clouds in the sky. On the right side of the picture, there's a boat on the lake. Um, in the middle distance, there are some cows. And in the far, to the far end of the lake, there's a bridge. Uh, and, so, and that kind of language, which we then boarded so that we were giving them um, a, a kind of scaffold for, that, for what comes next. So next, we asked the kids to go and draw themselves a picture. We had plenty of time, so no worries about you know, how long it was going to take. And, and we gave them as long as they wanted, really. Um, and interestingly, these two um, students bottom left were from Saudi Arabia, spent all their time, um, whenever they could, on their mobile devices. They were the last people in the world that we would expect to enjoy sitting down um, and just contemplating nature and drawing it. And yet they really did. So here are some of the pictures they came up with. I think um, the, the, the little boy who's standing there top right produced this picture here of a, a boat on the sea and um, birds in the distance. And um, the, the little boy who's sort of squinting through his fingers produced this one, which is quite an artistic uh, portrayal of the camp. Um, here's another one that um, was produced. It showed a fair level of artistry, I think. Um, I, I know it's not that easy for you to see, but believe me, it's, it's quite a good drawing. Um, and, and even, you know, simplistic drawings like this. I think this was done by one of the, um, one of the Saudi teenagers. Um, so clearly, you know, he'd not had a lot of practice in drawing, but it was fine because in terms of the activity, everything is there that's needed, including two little rabbits at the front. And then, of course, <laughs> you guessed, we asked them to uh, write about what they had, um, what they'd drawn. So they produced um, text like this. Um, a lot of work went into it. So I'll just read you a little bit of this. Um, in the middle, there are a few birds. On the left, there is a sailing boat with a, with a, he said a ball, he meant a boy, a floating boy at the front and a boy at the back. And next to it, um, there you see our 
another boat with a ball at the back. In the background, there's a forest with a mansion in the middle. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Above the forest, there is a sky with clouds and the sun is on the left. So they, they, this person has clearly um, been able to use the language that was introduced at the beginning and has transferred it to his own context. So that's it, describe and draw. Um, if you're looking for that image, it's called Wavenhoe Park. Um, if you are in uh, an urban situation, for example, um, or if you only meet your students for, you know, maybe an hour a week, you're not going to want them to spend an hour painting or drawing a picture. So just introduce a language in the class, ask them to draw a picture for homework, even better because when they come back, they can then describe their picture to another person while the other person tries to draw it. It's a real test of their ability to describe. And then compare pictures. So you compare the picture that's been described with the original picture that's been drawn. And then you can write descriptions and polish the language. Okay, um, we are, I've gone on a little bit longer than I intended, so I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm just going to finish with this. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Some of you will recognise it, some of you will, won't. Um, and it goes like this. In vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Um, for those of you who don't recognize it, it's the last verse of that poem I mentioned earlier on, The Daffodils by uh, William Wordsworth. Um, a fantastic poem, much more sophisticated than it appears at first sight. Uh, one I would really recommend that you do with your um, students. Um, if, they, if you can get them to memorize it, so much the better. Um, I have a worksheet based on the poem, um, if anybody's interested. But the reason I wanted to finish um, with this is because Wordsworth um, in this poem is expressing not just a connection with nature, but almost saying, you know, we are nature through our imagination, our meditations, our creativity. We're not just connected to it, we are part of nature. And when I'm uttering these words to you, I'm no different to a you know, a chimp making expressive noises to the rest of its tribe. So the sooner we all learn that we are nature and are not apart from it or separate from it, um, the better we will, the, the better the planet will be.